Show. I'm Lizette and this is my dad, Cliff Ruddle. How are you doing today? Just fine. Okay, so we have mentioned in past shows that you are working on gun supply projects that involve the trifecta and or triad. And by triad, we mean that you are developing new technology to handle each area of endodontic treatment, namely shaping, cleaning, and packing. So mm -hmm. I understand you've been doing a lot of field testing related to this project lately, right? We have, and, and actually it's been complicated because we've been doing all three aspects, the technology that would drive each aspect that you just mentioned. So um, the challenge is always is to create a set of instruments that are anatomically designed, that work synergistically with minimally invasive technologies that promotes three-dimensional clean and filling root canal systems. So uh, just to talk about the one we're working at probably the most intensely right now, just the way the project goes, is uh, are the files. And it's been really hard to uh, make a huge improvement over ProTaper Gold because... It's so excellent. <laughs> well, it's the number one sold file in the world. And just uh, for the viewers who don't maybe know a lot about file designs, but it could be anything from rake angle, cutting angle, helical angle, uh, tip geometries, taper, increasing percentage tapers, decreasing percentage tapers, centered massive rotation offset, massive rotation, alternating offset machining, heat treatment, cross section. There's a lot of stuff. And so you start to play with these things, but we are on the cusp of having something really special. And uh, it's going to be very big push towards a more anatomically driven shape but yet giving us the deep shape that other companies' files just don't produce. Okay, so just to clarify, it's you that is doing the testing and Professor Pierre Mosh too, and Dr. John West. That's right. right. Those are the, who's doing the testing. Right, and we get a lot of help from two engineers. I should acknowledge them, Gilbert Rota and Nico Cravassier. Okay, and now you told me that it was maybe like the 50th iteration that you were testing, but then I think Pierre came back to you and said, no, it was maybe over 100. <laughs> yeah, well, Pierre, you know, in his French way, he said, no, 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 no. Uh, I've tested about 55, and John West is maybe about 55, but since Pierre lives in Lausanne, and that's 30 minutes from the factory, uh, MyFair's factory, that's why Serona has the MyFair factory, um, he can go by car and they might bring him four of the same kind of files, but with four different designs or four different heat treatments or whatever. Well, he might eliminate two or three of them right away. Well, then John and I just see the one he liked the best. So do you test them on, you, you, you test them on plastic blocks? Is that what you do for the testing or natural teeth? Well, that's a great question because we do use a lot of plastic blocks and I want to make a, a very clear comment. We don't like to use 3D printed teeth because although they're really sexy and uh, they can be opaque, they can be translucent and they have curvatures and four canals and everybody likes that, the canals are just too big, okay? So when you open up into these teeth, it's not a really good test uh, of, of a natural tooth. So we start off with a very specific block. It's called an S block. The first curve is about 35 degrees and the second curve is about 35 degrees recurvature. So you have a big challenge and we like that because every block's the same length, same diameter, same curvature. So if you and I are comparing results, we have frozen a lot of the variables and now we can just talk about what was different between our results. Then we go from that to a 90 degree block and the 90 degree block, uh, it goes up and makes a 90, but it goes about five more millimeters to the terminus. So that really starts to check uh, cyclic fatigue. And then we go from there to natural teeth. And we try to choose teeth that are longer, more curved, you know, four canals, and that's kind of the, the goal. And would you say that you are all generally in agreement? You know, it's funny on all the big issues we are, but I would say more than we have disagreements, we have different observations. And so if you see something I never saw, it's not a disagreement, you're just pointing it out to me. And sometimes I'll see something they don't see or Pierre or John will pick up something. So all together we get insights that I think really drive design. Okay, now you just said at the beginning of our little discussion that um, you're getting close to the final version. When mm. do you expect to launch? 
Well, uh, we've been following these charts for a year and a half, and we're down to about six months. I would say, though, actually, uh, by Q4 this year, they'll we'll launch the file systems. And at one time, the launch was going to be simultaneous, first time in the world ever launch a shaping way, a way to shape, a way to 3D disinfect, uh, well beyond the endo activator, I might add, and cordless, and really easy for general dentists, affordable. <laughs> and then filling root canal systems. And we have some really cool things in new designs with filling root canal systems. Okay, well, it sounds exciting. And we also have an exciting show for you today. So let's get started. Q&A for you today, and this time it's going to center around dental medications, specifically anesthesia, antibiotics, and painkillers. And it's a little different than the other Q&As we've done because we've kind of just, you get asked these questions a lot. I'm not going to read a specific question that a person asked, but it's kind of going to be in the spirit of what we've been asked. You've batched them. Right. So the first question is... Um, a, a lot of clinicians have are having difficulty achieving profound anesthesia. So what tips do you have for this? I am the tip man. <laughs> well, I'll go to the easy one first. That's the maxillary arch. I don't really get questions around the world, how do you get profound anesthesia? Uh, normally, if we're doing molars, you know, in here, we're going to give that posterior, superior, alveolar nerve block, and that's going to get the molars Sometimes use ice, that's a little trick. Use ice in the palate and put the ice on, gets the palate tissue, that really dense tissue, very, very cold, and you can give a painless injection there. That'll give you enough uh, protection. Everything else is just infiltrations, just infiltrations. Look at how loose that cortical bone is. That bone absorbs that anesthesia. It's, it's a thin cortical plate. So dentists do not complain about maxillary teeth, uh, rarely. The ones they complain about are down on the mandible. And the mandible, we have a whole different thing. We have a big, thick, heavy cortical plate. And so uh, we do have the loose trabecular bone again, but the problem is, is getting the nerve block. So when you give that block and you're trying to hit the lingula, wow, I haven't spelled that for a while. You're trying to get that little foramen called the lingula and put your payload right in there. I usually use 1 to 50,000 xylocaine, uh, long acting. I did long blocks of time with patients, two in the morning, two in the afternoon. So I need anesthesia to last and not be wearing out halfway or deep into the procedure. And that's unsettling to have to take the dam off and repeat stuff. So be sure you get the block. Everybody knows this, but when you get the block, it's not just to the midline. There is some cross innervation bilaterally. So it needs to go across the midline a little bit to the contralateral side of the area you're going to anesthetize. That's a starting point. Everybody has to have that before we even now go into the tricks. So the tricks would be primarily you have stabident. Stabident was one of the first interosseous injections and that was the little trephine. You would go posterior to the tooth. So if you're gonna do the molar, you would go posterior to the tooth and you would go about four millimeters below the crest of bone and you would make a little perforation through the cortical plate. You'll feel the perforator fall into the cancellous bone because it's a lot softer. And that had a lot of success. People liked it, but the problem was even though you perforated and there'd be a little bit of blood oozing out of here, people would come up with their needles, no, 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 no. They couldn't find the hole because the hole's really small. So a new one came out that I thought was even better and it's called the X-Tip and it's a 
trephin with a cannula. So you trephin and pull out your trephin and it leaves a sleeve inside. And that sleeve is where you put your anesthetic needle in that sleeve to deposit a few drops in the bone. Go slow. Don't put a lot in. You can cause damage, just small infiltration. Look, you're just trying to buy a little time. You're not trying to have profound anesthesia for an hour, an hour and a half. You're just trying to get into the pulp chamber on your access. Once you get in here, you can give an interpulpal, and if, but you gotta get in without the patient hopping around the chair. My last one that I really like, so I had the stabodent, I had the X-tip, and then I like the I-L-I, interligamentary injection. That is where you take a very short, like I used a 30, 31 gauge needle, and you go right on the line angle between the tooth and the bone, and if your hand isn't trembling as you try to deposit, you didn't do it right. There needs to be a lot of pressure, so much that your hand will tremble a little bit and you'll see the tissue blanch and the patient will go numb. They'll, they'll be really profoundly numb. Last comment and then we're done, we're out. Once you get the nip, the lip numb and it's a hot tooth and let's by definition all call a hot tooth what it is. It's a vital, highly inflamed tooth. You already know when you go in, it's gonna really bleed. They're, they're gonna see a lot of bleeding. So once you get profound anesthesia, ask the question, do I have profound anesthesia? And take a piece of ice, go right back and rub that ice back and forth on the cervical from the DB to the MB, DB, MB, MB, and that warm tooth will melt that ice. And if they feel that, do not isolate the tooth. You're not ready to go yet. So you should always treatment plan for no surprises. When you tell patients you're not gonna hurt, then keep your word. And we've talked about some tricks today, so I think you can get back into these teeth a little bit easier. Okay, the next question will go to antibiotics now. What are the instances where you would see a need to prescribe antibiotics? Well, there's maybe three things, three categories uh, on this question and answer. Uh, how, how do they present? So the presentation, how they present. If they come in and they're a little swollen or maybe before you can see it, the asymmetry bilaterally, maybe they say it's a little full in the nasal labial fold, they're a little full, women will say right in here. Guys might say it's just tight, feels tight. Well, those are people that have infections and if you can do your diagnostics and say that it's endodontic and etiology or origin, then they should be on antibiotics, okay? Uh, there is another one, so how they present, we don't know, but it also could be an A and a B, and the B could be uh, their medical history. Their medical history. In other words, what if they uh, they have a scarlet fever, scarlet fever, mitral valve prolapse syndrome? What if they have a, a, a prosthetic hip, a knee? So I actually call the physicians. Uh, they say if more than one person is responsible for a miscalculation, no one's at fault. So you call the physician and just say, I'm gonna be doing a non-surgical procedure or whatever you're doing and just get their coaching. Would you like your patient premedicated on antibiotic or not? So those are the kinds of things that they have symptoms, of course, yes. And then if you're doing it for medical reasons, another one is, um, let's just say you're doing retreatment today, non-surgical, and you're removing a pesty silver point. Silver points are notorious to have post-op flare-ups. It's in the literature. And a lot of times we talked a little bit earlier about the corrosion, and we talked about how they can break down, tattoo the tissue and stuff. So if you have a silver point and you start to pull it out and it's black, I mean, even if they came in asymptomatic, just learn the literature, you know? In other words, you might not give the antibiotic and they might be fine, but if they aren't fine, you're already probably a day or two behind by the time they call you and say, I'm swollen, what should I do? Well, now you've got your, you're from behind, you're operating from behind. So uh, what if you have a tooth and you're treating it and it's necrotic, you go in, there's putrescence, it stinks, and your first file is up here. You know, and there's a big lesion. Well, you probably just inoculated Avogadro's number of bacteria periapically. That's sometimes when you might want to consider an antibiotic because you just create a riot probably. 
So common sense, you know when you have good control, you know when your link determinations are a little bit off, if you perforate in a necrotic tooth, things like that, you might want it. I, I just want for clarification, yeah. so say you did perforate and you repaired it, but the tooth wasn't necrotic to begin with. Is it not really necessary to, you wouldn't just automatically prescribe antibiotics? That's a great question. And now we're starting to make the huge distinction between vital cases versus necrotic gangrene necrosis putrescent when you're working in vital cases there's no there's no infection there's plenty of inflammation so probably you don't need if i perf a vital case i should be able to repair it and maybe just the topic you're going to talk about next analgesics but i don't anticipate i need an antibiotic okay so this is really the big thing to know so those are the three instances where you should be thinking about medications i like uh, in the penicillin family, I like amoxicillin the best. It's the most prescribed in North America. Uh, Pin VK is common. Well, okay, so three instances, whatever the patient might have when they present, then whatever happens during the treatment, but then also maybe if they get an infection post-treatment, then is that the third situation? Oh, yes, I guess I forgot. Okay. Yeah, the <laughs> on the third one, uh, let's say that you do a procedure and the decision technically and professionally is not to use an antibiotic and you go home take you for an example and because you had a root canal by a specialist in town and it wasn't it was not terry pancock anyway you had major problems because they left the k they missed the canal they perforated mm -hmm. well it was a necrotic tooth so why they told you big pat on the back you'll be fine but by the time and so you thought you were supposed to be fine you lost a day by the second day, you were thinking, I'm in trouble, and you call and you get an antibiotic. Well, now you're really behind. So if there is post-operative infection and pain, that's not normal from an endodontic procedure. When you work normally in endodontics, uh, you're not using a lot of antibiotics. So it's not normal to give them. But if you call me substant to my procedure, I have somehow provoked a, a riot. Okay. And then I guess this sort of connects to the last thing we're going to talk about painkillers or what you prescribe post-treatment do you did you normally send people away with just um like advil or motrin or something like ibuprofen or do you prescribe like something stronger you know it's 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 nice to talk about this because it's changed a lot uh 50 years ago when i got out there was quite a bit of codeine and tylenol you know mm -hmm. aspirin and codeine uh, a narcotic and that was not necessarily given, but we were thinking along those lines. But over the decades, it's become very clear that ibuprofen is fabulous. Uh, 400 milligrams, four times a day. You can even have them double up 800 milligrams, four, uh, four times a day. So 800 times four, 3,200. And I, I would do that for a couple of days. So I would do one you know based on if it was a little inflammation or okay pain can be mo mild moderate or severe so for moderate to for, for let's say mild to moderate pain it would just be ibuprofen uh advil you know, is two is a capsule for your stomach. It's got a coating on it. But if you take two Advils, they're 200 milligrams. That's one ibuprofen. So that's been very, very good. Um, really, they're doing a lot of studies over the last decades, and they're finding out even if you use things like hydrocodone, oxycodone, really fentanyl, really big opiates, that if you just do two things like acetaminophen in conjunction with this, it's like one plus one is four, so it's synergistic, and people do really, really fine. Now, to back up and say it all different, we rarely gave out narcotics. Even after periapical surgery, it, it isn't necessary. It's not an infection. It's inflammatory, and that's 48 to 72 hours is maximum peak inflammation. So if we get in there and do our procedure, we cause some inflammation, but healing should already begin. So these more mild hitters tend to be more effective, and don't tell people they're pain pills. Tell them they're for to reduce inflammation. Okay, uh, that's what I was going to say because even if the patient goes home and they say I have no pain, maybe they should take this anyways because of for the, is an anti-inflammatory. Because if they outsmart you, they don't take it, and then a day later they say now it's starting to hurt. Okay. 
you're behind again. So the point would be taken that uh, you want to get ahead of things. Sometimes they would come in and we would be, before we'd lean them back to do the procedure, the girl, the little gal, my assistants, I love them to death, they'd come with a cup of water and a little envelope with two Motrins, 400 milligrams each, and it'd be down the hatch before Ruddle even gave the injection. So I'm getting blood levels while I'm working, and when I'm done, I have serum levels. Isn't that cool? And then we'd say, take take Motrin, 400 milligrams QID for two days. And no, not for pain, you're taking it to reduce inflammation. Okay, yeah, I, I ha I've had three root canals, and I did have the one problem with the one, but even when that one was retreated, on the night of my first two root canals and on the night of the retreatment, I could chew fine on those teeth. I mean, I didn't really have any pain. It was uh, pretty much like I, I could chew normally, but I just was careful. That's the difference of going to a master clinician, Dr. Terry Pancuck, and going to another one, and that's Dr. Oh, I didn't say his name. X. Dr. <laughs> X. Now, maybe in a future show, we'll out Dr. X. <laughs> I don't know if that's necessary. Well, we'll have to take our meds first. Okay. Well, that's the end of this segment. Thanks, Dad, for another great Q&A. And that's it. Thanks. And listen, keep your questions coming because you would think these are pretty rudimentary, but they come in enough that finally we said we better address it. So, yes. thanks. Today we're going to have a little lesson on how to remove silver points. Uh, before I got started on this little assignment, uh, Phyllis, my wife of 53 years, said, does anybody do silver points anymore? So maybe just a little bit of background. In the 40s, the late 30s and 40s, a guy named Jasper introduced silver points to our profession. Soon, in the United States, it was taught in most dental schools. Thousands of dentists were trained how to place them. Millions of patients received them, and the profession became pretty enamored with these radiopaque wires traveling through underprepared canals, but they look good radiographically. But the problem is there was white abuse, and silver points fell out of favor because why? They leak internally. They're round. It's an elemental silver, as we all know, so it's round theoretically. Canals are never round, so there was a great reliance uh, on the sealer. So if the sealer began to wash out, then the silver points could corrode, and these corrosion products have been known to stain tissues. You'll see uh, tattoos, okay? You'll see absolutely tattoos in the attached and lying mucosa if you practice for a few years. And those are a lot of times from a fistulous or a sinus tract. Silver points can basically be thought of as uh, three kinds. There's many more, but three kinds. We have pretty thin ones and really, uh, very small silhouettes, and sometimes just on the manipulation of trying to remove them, they can disintegrate. Then we have some that on the opposite end are like a post, and they're huge. And then, of course, we have the sectional silver point. Uh, we'll look at that right now. Uh, a lot of times, if a dentist was going to do a post, as an example, they would take a silver point, notch it, place the silver point in a linear motion to length, then rotate the top, and they would break it off right there. And that way a post could go in if deemed necessary. So we had thin ones, post size like ones, and then we have basically the sectional point or the split cone. So of course, techniques begin to evolve to address these three kinds of silver points in retreatment. And still today, many dentists around the world will send me cases and want coaching on how to remove silver points. So even though they were taught many, many decades ago and used probably through the 70s, uh, I knew people even in the 70s and early 80s that were still using them in certain kinds of cases, probably in today's world, we're not seeing any silver points placed to any large scale. So probably the removal of them will go down over more years, but we still see them. They're one of the four commonly placed obturation materials we find in the canals. Gutta percha, silver points, carrier-based obturators, CBOs, and paste fillers. Well, when we retreat, we have to think about the silver point up in the chamber because that part can easily be hit with a burr when we're reintroducing our 
armamentarian to get access. And of course, the access cavity as we drill down and brush away to structure or metals or composites or cements, it's easy for that burr to inadvertently hit the top of the silver point and all of a sudden it can get shorter and then it's much harder to get out because there's no handle. This is the handle that we could use to get a purchase on it to actually remove it. So be careful on your access and plan it thoughtfully. A lot of times there's a casting on this too. And if there's a casting, you don't see any of this. So you just see a silver point going down subcrestal. So be very careful on the access. It's thoughtful, it's planned, and you brush your way in. We don't drill into teeth. We brush cut our way as we move towards the roof of the chamber where it used to be and finally to uncover. So the techniques that have emerged are quite a few. And uh, we're gonna go through all these. So the list seems maybe a little formidable right now, but just uh, get the list kind of in your head and then we'll give examples, examples, and examples, and we'll work our way through the list. This is not the complete list. And in fact, when I used to teach this class to people that traveled in from around the world in Santa Barbara, we gave a two day course, 10 hours each day. We were on silver points for two hours. Today I'm on it for 30 minutes. Okay, let's look at grasping pliers. Stiglitz are still one of the very best pliers that can be purchased to extract or extricate a silver point from a root canal system. They are too big. They're a little bit too big up in this area. So what Ruddle likes to do is modify them in a laboratory. So I can go to a general dentist office and they have lays and wheels and I can trim down these wings and make a smaller silhouette. I'm pretty careful not to really change too much the most distal aspect of the instrument. But this means you can introduce these down through a restrictive access, say, and then you can open them and get over the silver point and close and get the purchase. Sometimes it's hard to get them open if you have these wings. So that's a little trick. Of course, we can use direct and indirect ultrasonics to remove silver points. Let me be very, very clear. We use direct ultrasonics direct ultrasonics on cements, composites, amalgam fragments to blow them up, to disintegrate them and uncover the head of the silver point. We never use ultrasonics directly on a silver point. Again, I said it was elemental silver. It is, it's very soft, easy to abrade, and all of a sudden an ultrasonic instrument can completely knock off and wipe out the handle that would have been where you grabbed it for the purchase to extricate it from the canal. So we have coated tips. These are the Pro Ultras. They're called the Pro Ultras. And these are from Densply Serona. This has a zirconium nitride coating. Uh, I've said this before, but when we invented these some years ago, what made them unique is they were the first contra-angle instruments in the world just like all your other tools. So they actually fit easily over the mesial marginal ridge of a lower molar into the MB or the ML systems. They were the first instruments in the world to be coated so that they were abrasive and they could actually cut more efficiently. And the third thing is they were pretty much just, we'll do two lines, parallel. This is tapered, but as you get down to the four, the five and the six, seven and eight, these are pretty much the first ones in the world that were parallel. So if we drop them in a canal, you could have a line of sight, a quarter vision alongside the instrument so you could see the tip of the instrument engaging and working. So that's just a little bit about that. So we'll use ultrasonics on buildups and cores that are hiding the silver point. They're entombed inside. And then we'll use indirect ultrasonics. So here we are using the tapered number two, and it's a pretty stout instrument. It's tapered, it's strong, it's, a, it's effective. Notice that there's no visual obstruction by a big head of a handpiece. A lot of times I watch people in workshops and they're trying to see because they're using their high-speed handpiece when they could eliminate that head. Always chip out on that leading edge. Uh, if you're breaking up a slab of concrete and you're in construction, and you're running a jackhammer, you don't start in the middle of the slab, you get out on the leading edge and that vibratory sinusoidal wave will split, break up and disintegrate even the hardest of cores. 
And as you begin to expose the MB, the DB, you can now work between the axial wall and the silver point. But if your instrument's profile is a little bit too big, it's okay to go to a smaller instrument that can fit into the space between the silver point and the axial wall. And that's what we're gonna be doing here, just right here. So we switch tips. It's a more appropriate size tip. I can get a little bit deeper and we wanna completely eliminate all the buildup from the pulp chamber and have the silver points visually identified. Okay, you can grab it with a plier, but a lot of times I'll have the assistant grab my plier. Double pliers, that's an idea. Think of fulcrum mechanics, that's another trick. Double plier, first trick. Second one, fulcrum mechanics. In other words, don't indirect ultrasonics, okay? so. Why you're pulling and doing a little rocking motion, have the assistant hit the engaged steglitz with ultrasonics and indirect ultrasonics just send a powerful piezoelectric wave of energy down to the steglitz into the engaged silver point. Again, don't just pull straight up. It's a little rocking motion. Try to fulcrum off of something. Try to fulcrum a little bit. Fulcrum mechanics. Very powerful adjuncts to removing silver points. Little trick, when you uncover your silver points and you just drop in and you find everything, grab the silver point that's exposed to the plier and just test it. Give it a, a firm little pull, vertical, out of the tooth. Uh, judge the, the path of insertion as the path of removal. Pull on that axis and see if anything moves a little bit. If it's not moving, don't start grabbing it and really manipulating because you're gonna break the handle. So you're pulling intentionally to see if it might move a little bit. If it does, then you can go ahead and do fulcrum mechanics or indirect ultrasonics or the double Steiglitz trick. <laughs> All right, so we're making some progress. Next, uh, I'm gonna pause this if I can. I'll set this up. This is a maxillary molar. We're in the DB. It's a sectional silver point. There is a four to five millimeter fragment in the DB. I presented this many years ago at the Chicago Midwinter Meeting. Uh, Phyllis and I were at the University of Illinois, about 20 or 30 miles away, and they used the Super Bowl truck, literally, that they used for the Super Bowl to beam our signal to the McCormick Center where there was a core audience of about 750 people. So I'm explaining to the audience how to remove a sectional silver point that's deep in the DB. And we're gonna be using some files and we're gonna be using some solvents. So the solvent can be xylol or chloroform. You use a straight stiff tin file and it's pick, 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 pick and you begin to uh, undermine the sealer. The sealers are miscible in the solvent, typically, and so as you begin to dissolve the sealer, the silver point becomes more free. So after we use the 10, go right to the 15, put a little bit more solvent in the pulp chamber, and that'll follow the pilot hole of the 10. Don't take the 10 out too quick. Try to get quite a bit past the head of the silver point. Try to get good overlap, several millimeters. Now the 15 goes into that hole, same motion. At some point, you can start to actually insert the file on different orientations around the silver point, north, east, south, west. And a little bit more irrigation with the solvent, give you a little bit of visibility. Now you're looking deep into the apical one-third of that DB, and at high magnification, we can push in, and we can see we have space. What you're doing with these hand files is you're undermining the seal of the silver point and you're taking away material. That means you're making vacated space. That vacated space has potential. We can talk about Hedstrom displacement. Uh, many years ago, I first talked about this uh, back in the late 70s, but if you can make some space by removing sealers that were placed in that era, they're usually a Grossman type sealer, zinc oxide and eugenol, then you have space lateral to the silver point. One of the most potent ideas to remove that silver point is headstrom displacement. Typically, you take a 35 or a 45, somewhere in there, and they have a positive rake angle. Silver is very soft. So you can take this headstrom 
And this is not how you use them if you were using them as a shaping file, but in a retreatment, you actually screw the headstrom gently but firmly into that vacated space. And you'll see, you'll actually see the headstrom form threads. It'll actually make cutting grooves on this silver point. When you get a pretty good overlap going, that means you have a better purchase. And sometimes then if you go to pull the headstrom, the cutting side on the plastic in this case, or on the dentin, it can be really hard to pull that headstrom up. So if you're having trouble pulling the headstrom up, I'm gonna show you a trick. But anyway, this is how it works. So just keep watching. And you can see we're beginning to slide that thing up. We're beginning to haul it up and out of the tooth and out it goes. So that's an idea. Make space for a more efficient instrument, headstrom displacement. Now back to this case in Chicago, we screw the 35 headstrom in and then this is called the Ruddle Post Removal System. It has extracting pliers if you're pulling on that headstrom and you got both feet on their chest and you got your assistant, you know, who's a Nautilus gymnast, you know, very, very strong upper body, and you're both pulling with all of your might, you can't get it, take the extracting plier. By turning the screw knob clockwise, these two jaws begin to separate. And these two jaws, one pushes down on the tooth one pulls up on the handle of the headstrom, and you can very control method, you can screw the knob and you can jack that silver point fragment right out of the canal. Let's take a look and see how that would work. So you can see we're mounting up on the extracting plier, and then here we are, pop goes the weasel, up comes that silver point, and that's a real big thrill. So crawl, walk, run. You don't just jump into these cases immediately and start doing them, but you start with your gutta percha removal. We talked about that. And then you can start with some silver points and maybe some simpler teeth. I want to come back to the Ruddle Post Polar Kit. And I want to talk about microtubes. I've talked a lot about right microtubes. And what I'm not going to talk about today, I'll just say right now. I've talked in other segments about the file removal system. It has specifically designed tubes. They're designed to go over an obstruction. They can go over, over an obstruction to get a purchase. I'm not going to talk about those, but I use that idea a lot in wispy silver points, the really small diameter ones, the ones that are, you know, you don't want to start wiggling the head of it or you might break it. So I want to introduce another kind of a tube and it comes right out of this kit. This is the number one and this is the number two. And what's important is the ID, in this case, the inside diameter. So any silver point that's sticking up into the pulp chamber that is greater than six tenths of a millimeter, that means almost all of them, you can tap it. It's very soft silver. You can turn counterclockwise. This tap turns. Okay, it's not clockwise. Counterclockwise engages. Reverse screw, okay? And you can jump this over the head of a silver point that's exposed. So let's take a look at this. So here's a pre-op, and you can see uh, a silver point left in the mesial system. Uh, what you don't see is that there were two silver points. One was in the DB, one was in the DL. Endodontist number one took those out. Endodontist number two got, got it out of the ML, okay? The patient was upset with the first one, got upset with the second one because it was taking too much time. Maybe there's just a communication problem. It takes as much time as it takes to be successful, right? Within reason, if you got the right technology, a little bit of training and some experience. So this is my pre-op. I took out the provisional, took out the cotton pellet, and you can see there's not much left. Here's the floor. So there's not very much sticking up above the floor. What do you see? What do you think this is? I won't draw right on, I'll draw parallel to it. What do you think that is? What do you think that is? 
That is a shelf of overlying dentin. That's pulpal roof. This is all pulpal roof. So if I can take that off with ultrasonics, okay, and I take that off, I can actually make the silver point appear to be longer. So instead of it being like this, now it's like that. So I have a bigger handle, a longer handle to grab. So here we go. So uh, we have the movie, but these are just some still grabs. So here's going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, right up to that axial wall, right to the axial wall. And it's gonna end up looking about like that. So now I have about two millimeters of silver point supra orifice level. I'm thrilled. I've also gone around a little bit carefully to expose it circumferentially. Now, because it's about seven or eight tenths of a millimeter, I can bring in the number one tubular tap, tubular tap. And remember, it turns counterclockwise. You will then engage with its distal end, the silver point. You can either pull straight up or you can use the extracting plier and in a very controlled way, jack that silver point out of there. How about that? Well, retrievement's fun because it's mechanical. So you're always thinking, it's not this or this, it's neither either or, it's usually and both. Lots of ideas. Once it's out, then it's clean and shaping. And what was kind of fun is we ended up with getting a third system. So there's three, three portals of exit on the mesial root. And somewhere in the body, there's another whole branch that Ruddle didn't know. I was putting my files here. I was putting my files there. I wasn't uh, aware of this one whatsoever. Of course, we had two in this distal, so we got five portals of exit on that molar. And we still have good tooth structure, and we can go ahead and get the feral effect, and we can restore the tooth and have predictably successful results. Well, this was the last one on my list. Do you remember that? So... I want you to think about silver points. They corrode, and when they corrode, corrosion products leak out, and it causes oscillatic activity, bone loss. We sometimes will see a fissure develop. We can see a tattoo, as I've mentioned, and sometimes these cases notoriously flare up, as we mentioned in a previous part of the same show. And this is sometimes when you start to take a corroded wire and start manipulating it, maybe you use some chemicals. Now you're and you use an ultrasound, you're starting to get all the players together to create a riot, okay? That may be an insurrection uh, below the roots. You don't wanna do that. So let's think about when we might use antibiotics and when we not, let's be careful. This is obviously draining. And the good news here is we have laterally condensed gutta percha. So everybody knows how to get gutta percha out. But when you get that gutta percha out, that silver point coronally is gonna start flopping around and you're gonna go, whoa, I think I can get to it. I think I might be able to extricate it. So then you only have to think about, is it gonna be a modified Steiglitz? Am I gonna grab it with my Steiglitz and hit it with ultrasound, indirect ultrasonics? Is it gonna be tap and thread? Is it gonna be headstream displacement? See, now you got some ideas. So that's how we looked at that case and why the endoactivator? Because there's anatomy in these teeth. You can't see more than about 50 microns of resolution so you don't often see lateral canals on films, but you see evidence of lateral canals because you see a lesion of endodontic origin, a leo, and the leos form adjacent to the portals of exit. So we roadmap this, and by roadmapping, we can almost, in our mind's eye, we can build a library of cases we've treated over the years and we would expect a lateral canal. So when you're using chemicals as an example, you can get a slurry of chloroperca, and that can block or occlude the opening to the lateral canal. Now your reagents don't get into the lateral canal and you can't clean the lateral canal and you leave stuff in the lateral canal. So when you pack, you can't overcome stuff left behind. So what's our major problem in failures is we have residual tissue after pulp death. So we gotta get everything out. So we need to have some idea to get these chemicals agitated to get the slurries out so we can open up the lateral anatomy and get our materials to flow in. Here we go. 
This is the endo activator. In the United States, it's about 550 US dollars. It uses a polymer tip. The polymer tip doesn't cut. It fractures liquids. Go to another segment, watch the shows. But we have 19 peer-reviewed scientific papers that validate its clinical use. You can choose the tip that you want. But when you're, you can put these in chloroform or xylol. Ruddle said you can put them in chloroform or you can put them in xylol. They will not melt. These are the most impervious tips in the business. They're made of Delrin. That's used in medicine. It's used by orthopedic surgeons. So go in here and agitate. So after you get that silver point out, Okay, get the laterally condensed, got a perch out, get all that out. Now you have a loose point. You'll choose your method to get it out, get it purchased. There's not so much shaping to do, but there is some cleaning to do. So fill this thing brimful with chloroform, hit it with the endo activator, do that for about 30 seconds, and then go right to your ED. TA 17% and do that for one minute. Now pull that out and use sodium hypochlorite. Well, so I just got to get everything in here sodium hypochlorite. And you do that for one minute. Okay. And now you have the opportunity to clean laterally. Now, when you down pack out with the lateral canal, back pack, and then watch the bone fill. So here we are many, many years later, probably a couple decades, and notice how predictably successful Endyx is. Uh, so remember, it's not just a silver point, it's retreating the root canal system. So real quick, we can finish up. Uh, I'm just coming back to some B cautionary uh, notes. Uh, you see these silver points, they're not so easy to see, but maybe Maybe you see this one in here. Uh, maybe you kind of see this one in here. Uh, they're not so easy to see. So when you're tunneling back in, be careful. Brush in mesial to distal, buckle to lingual as you progressively work towards the pulp chamber. You'll see maybe a little shiny silver dot. Stop, get out your ultrasonic unit. Brrr, start blowing out that buildup. The short one is the MB. Uh, the lesion, here's the radiographic apex. I'm reading the radiographic apex is right here. It's kind of like that. But the canal comes up and ends over here. And we know that because that's where the lesion of endodontic origin is. It's over on the side. So we expect this to actually go up, could, bif could bifurcate, but probably it's going to come over like this. And then we got to do a little bit more work in the DB, it's not uh, properly shaped. It's pretty much a parallel canal. I think the minimally invasive dentist would just love that shape. If they could just imagine, I love this word imagine, we're gonna reimagine. It's not a silver point, it's BC sealer. Now you're loving it. It's a nice skinny shape with BC sealer. All right, and so a little endodontics, improve the shape, get to length. Notice that abrupt curve we made. I mean, goes just like that. And the lesions do form adjacent to the portals of exit. We just beat that to death. There's a couple systems in here. It's a fin, a uh, fin off the MB. So that's complete endodontics. And we got a good straight line access right there. So following the tenets that lead to success. Now, this is a case that was shared to me by a dear friend of mine, Mike Shinamblo. Michael J. Shinamblo. Michael J. Shinamblo. Uh, we were classmates together at Harvard Foresight in grad school under uh, my mentor, Al Krakow. And uh, this is one of those heavy split cone cases. I showed it as my first slide today. And you can see what's going on is there's a little laterally condensed sealer probably, but that is a massive <laughs> distal end of a silver point. It's like a post that was pounded in with a sledgehammer. Notice where the lesion is. It's not just apical, it's a wraparound lesion. Lesions wrap around, not because they're trying to crawl up and drain like we learned in dental school a long time ago. They, they form there because we must anticipate there could be lateral anatomy. So Mike gets back in here, 
drills down carefully. You can see he identifies something shiny. Okay, something shiny. He stops. Now he's got to do ultrasound circumferentially around that, expose it more. Then he can use a 10 file, a 15 file, and he can work his way laterally. Maybe, maybe you can see it. Maybe right there you see just the end of the file. Now I'll get this out of the way so you can see it. So he's bypassed the whole segment, 10, 15. Well, you can put a 25 head strip in or a 30. I said 35 or 45, but if you don't have the room, you can always drop down a little bit and pop goes the weasel. And you can see, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And remember, A still does equal pi r squared. So that is a significant pyramidal diameter, probably more like 150, 160, but the key is Mike has deep shape. He has deep shape. Every cross-sectional diameter is getting smaller and smaller and smallest. So when he's packing, he's packing into resistance form. His reagents have limitations to how much they can move in an apical direction because of the shape. So deep shape is one of the biggest keys to predictably successful endodontics. So, there we go. Mike turned something that was a lemon into lemonade. In the last case, uh, one of my referrals, uh, he came in with a little problem, he said. He waited so long that he's lost the crest of bone. He has a little infrabony pocket. So he has a little infrabony pocket. You can see it's probably scalping around like this. Got a little furcle problem. It's an old silver point case. Very thin ones, medium sized one, quite thick one, and all entombed in a buildup. Measure twice, you can only cut once. So basically, you know, we got them out. Do a lot of irrigation. If you look very carefully, there is a little bit of communication out here. There's a little communication. Uh, Larry passed away, so I never saw him again, but I was always wondering, I wonder how the bone worked at the moment he did pass away, because it was about two years later. But he had the tooth, and that's a little lesson today on retreatment. We talked about silver points, and in that context, may you get your silver points out, may you have some ideas and some ways to think about doing it, and have some fun. Crawl, walk, run. close our show today with another Ruddle rant. And if you haven't seen the last one we did, it's where um, my dad, Cliff, has a minute to talk about a topic and to say whatever he feels that he needs to say about it. Okay, don't start it yet. And we have this little like timer here that's a minute. So he gets to talk until it runs out and then he gets cut off. He has to stop. <laughs> Can't even finish a sentence. Okay, so here is the first topic for you. The first topic is leaving bacteria behind. Oh, that makes me really angry. You know, I went to Boston for graduate school and of course the whole emphasis is remove the root canal system like the extraction. But then we have clowns out there that write articles and they want to leave bacteria behind. And there's a new model for learning and there's a new healing model and there's a biological model that's emerged just in recent memory. And now we can leave bacteria talk to, behind. Talk to them. Oh, so anyway, um, I love how we fight about leaving bacteria behind. Have I left bacteria behind? Of course I've left bacteria behind because I don't think we get them all out, but I've never advocated. Let's try to leave bacteria behind and let's work on a different biological model. It's pretty, uh, it's small thinking because make it easy, extract the tooth and the bone will grow back in and everybody will be happy and the patients will smile. Leave bacteria behind and you have to be God chair side. You have to decide, this person has to have bacteria. This person gets okay. a clean root canal. Time's up. Oh, okay. Time's up. So just to just summarize really quick, is that one of the reasons why root canals fail most often is because <laughs> bacteria is left behind? I have a lot to say that I couldn't say. 100% uh, of all endodontic failures, regardless of etiology, is microbial. That's bacteria. 
So if we start with the end in mind, we might want to eliminate the cause of failure. Okay, next topic is the AAE Discussion Forum. Well, the AAE Discussion Forum is in the purest sense. It's a wonderful model for colleagues all over the world to come online and pose a question and get an answer. And that's really nice. The only problem is it's always about the same three or four people. They're doing all the answering and there's people lurking. You can tell there's lurkers because all of a sudden they come up, you know, they, 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 they come out of nowhere and they just I had a question about calculus on the roof. And I'm going, my God, they talked about calculus. Okay, so you raise the flap, lift up the flap, and some people saw calculus. It looked like calculus, it smelled like calculus, it had the appearance of calculus. Then there was a peridot, and I was like, there's no calculus on roofs. That's a misnomer. Well, I'm sitting there going, does anybody biopsy anymore? All we do is cut off the end of the road, send it off to histology. Histologists come back and say, there's uh, calciferites. There, there are calcium deposits on that road. That would be calculus. Time's up. Oh. So maybe you need to insert your comments into the forum. <laughs> I would never pose a question on the forum because I notice, well, it's quite civil now. You know, it used to, they, they took it down, as you know, for months. We had that discussion. And now that it's been re-resurrected, I almost feel like there's policemen. <laughs> I almost feel like there's a guard, like on every block. Maybe it's like Washington, D.C. We got the razor wire around. We keep out the bad questions, the bad people, the people that spark a little controversy. Keep them out. The policeman is mom over your shoulder. Uh, <laughs> I maybe. don't think you should jump into this mess. I will say, <laughs> though, uh, the... The, the concept of the forum is excellent, and there are some good people. I've mentioned Richard Swartz. He's a, a dear friend. He's a very nice guy. But sometimes I wonder also by the questions, did anybody go to grad school? Okay. Oh, sorry. All right. The last one is more of a personal topic for you, <laughs> um, and it's the Las Vegas Raiders. I thought you were going to get personal. Well, my problem is, having ran a business for almost 50 years, and looking at organizations around the world in dentistry, how come some practices are always doing well and some are always struggling? And then I think of my Raiders, formerly the Oakland Raiders, now the Las Vegas Raiders, pride and poise, silver and black, commitment to excellence, right? Well, that was like 20 years ago. So how come you can have like the New England Patriots, they're always in the games. They're always going to the playoffs. The Green Bay Packers, uh, the Lambs, I mean the Rams, I mean they even got to go a couple times. How come an organization can't get back? It makes me think it's an ownership deal. At some point you could say, well, we didn't have a quarterback who broke his ankle. Oh, our wide receiver, he burned his feet. By God, he went into that sauna, sun and he just burned those feet. He couldn't get his feet down to run the flight pattern. Oh, he can blame all that, but you know what? It's probably the coach, the owner, the quarterback coach, the linebacker coach, the defensive coach. It's about leadership. Okay, time's up. Oh. Yeah, it sounds like there might be a little bit of a defensive problem there, but they fired their defensive coordinator, so maybe it'll be different next year. should be able year. to get back to the playoffs, <laughs> you know, a little bit better every time. Like in Indo, you get a little better every case, right? Well, next year. Next year, yeah, that's what we always <laughs> say. Next year for the Raiders. Okay, well, that's our show for today. Hope you enjoyed it, and see you next time on The Rubber Show.